Fantastic. Well, it's 12.30. Uh, a very, very warm welcome to the Resolution Revolution. It starts here. So my name's David Little. I'm the uh, Chief Executive Officer and the founder of a, of a wonderful little company called the TCM Group. And we help companies to um, embed and integrate alternative systems for resolving the kind of challenges that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. You know, conflicts, disputes, disagreements, falling out, not seeing eye to eye so on and so forth, the kind of stuff which we know is challenging, that we know is difficult to handle, that's difficult to manage. So we'll help organisations to handle it a little bit better, and that's often about creating the conditions for dialogue, uh, conditions for people to talk, to listen, to engage with each other, to really hear each other, to understand each other, and to draw our insight. And today's webinar, the focus of today's webinar, the reason that we brought today's webinar um, uh, out is to say to organizations there are better ways of resolving issues than perhaps the current systems that we are all familiar with. In actual fact, the current systems as, as I've seen them, and I think as many people have described them to me, is what uh, what I've heard is that the current systems, the disciplinary and grievance processes in, in our organisations, actually inhibit or prevent that kind of dialogue from happening. So today's webinar is about helping you, HR professionals and leaders, ask some, some questions, some challenging questions. Why do we do it this way? And is there a better way of handling discipline and grievance issues in the workplace? And today I'll be um, giving you some of my answers. I, I guess you might already know what my answers might be, but I'm hoping to share with you some insights and experience from my own work in trying to help companies to manage this stuff differently. So very, very warm welcome. This is a really popular webinar. I can see we've, uh, we've actually got people dialing in now there's a lot of people joining the webinar so if you're just joining us a very very warm welcome I'm David David Little and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar welcome to the resolution web uh, res, res, <laughs> that's a mouthful welcome to the resolution revolution uh, and that's only after a cup of coffee okay so the webinar is going to be about 45 minutes long uh, as I said in my email to, 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 to those of you who received it this morning, I'm going to stay online after the 45 minutes. I'm going to stop recording the webinar uh, and you can ask me some of those questions, maybe questions that you wouldn't like to have recorded and shared on YouTube. Fine. So we'll stop the webinar at 45 minutes and I will stay online and run a kind of clinic session for those of you who want to stay online and join me. For, but for those of you who need to uh, dial off at four, in 45 minutes time, I will do my absolute utmost to have got through the material by then. So I have pressed the record button, sometimes I forget to do that, so I have done it. And just to confirm, we will be posting this online on our YouTube channel and our Vimeo channel. And I'll also be sending out a copy of the recording to each and every one of you who is here today so that you can also share it with your colleagues and others who may be interested. It's going to be interactive. I really do welcome questions throughout. Um, let me just talk you through if you've not been on one of our webinars before or use this system, you've got a console in front of you, feel free to ask questions through the console. I've also put some handouts on there for you, some articles and also the slide deck from today, which you've got on there as well, so you can refer to that later. And there's a little poll we'll be running at the end. So try and make it fun, try and make it interactive and try and answer the questions that you've got, those really difficult questions about how do we resolve some of these people issues in a more constructive, values-based, compassionate way. So it's lunchtime. Um, the wind is still blowing outside my uh, my window. Here. So there's a storm blowing outside, but today this webinar is going to be about calm and peace and, uh, and and constructive remedies. So sit back, please, do relax and enjoy. And there's a little bit of social media contact for those of you who are into such things as social media, which I know is all of us. So what will we cover in the 45 minutes? I'm going to introduce you to TCM. I know a number of you who are uh, dialed in today know the business, know us, and uh, I won't spend too long on it. But I think for those of you who don't know TCM or or not uh, familiar with us, I'd like to just tell you a little bit about our company. And we're going to look at conflict and why does it happen, and, and also why are the traditional responses to conflict, and particularly the disciplinary and grievance routes, why don't they work? What What's going wrong? I'm going to look at how organisations are taking a radical view, a culture shift, you know, a real shift in focus and mindset and energy to try and resolve issues more constructively. And that's about shifting the vernacular, the language, the mindset and the culture of our organisations and moving from discipline and grievance, these horrible words, which, uh, as, as we'll see, conjure up a whole range of different negative emotions for the people involved, actually focus on resolution, outcomes outcomes oriented values based principles led that good stuff which i know those of you who are in the hr profession will be dealing with right now 
from the new CIPD HR profession map. And hopefully we've also got Joanna Wheelahan, who's our head of resolution services. And she's very kindly dashed back from a meeting that she was at this morning with one of our customers to come in and share her tools and tips and strategies to help you embed a culture of resolution. So Joanna, if you're there, we will come to you shortly and looking forward to hearing your practical tools to help us find a solution to some of this stuff. So a little bit about TCM. So I set the TCM group up in um, in 2000, established and uh, incorporated in 2001. Um, my, my, I had a charity doing this stuff before. I worked in, in community disputes, neighbour disputes. I went to work in schools and in the criminal justice system through a wonderful process called restorative justice. So I became deeply immersed in the world of non-violent communication, uh, restorative justice, mediation and alternative dispute resolution pretty much for my entire career. My first degree was in uh, community and race relations, so a real passionate advocate of diversity and inclusion and initiatives in communities and, and also in the workplace. We've won awards at TCM, we have our own model, our um, proprietary model called the FAIR model, of facilitate, appreciate, innovate, resolve, think of that as the Intel processor that powers our company and that's very much about how we work, facilitate conversations, build appreciation, empathy and, innovate, and help create innovative solutions which resolve problems and create a resolute, committed outcome for the parties. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about whole systems thinking and how it's influencing our work at TCM and how we're working with organisations to use whole systems processes to, to, to shift the culture. It's really interesting and I'm actually uh, writing a book about at the moment and we support managers and HR and others through developing and delivering training programs for our customers. Uh, so that's a little bit about us. So let's move into the uh, little bit of a introduction there. Some of the work we've done, we've worked with a wide array of organisations. Um, some of these have, have developed mediation, all of them have integrated mediation in one form or another, but a number of these have also now started to move away from the language of discipline and grievance towards resolution. So a number of those organisations stand out there. So Virgin Atlantic, the Greater London Authority, AIG, TSB, there's others there. The Lloyds Banking Group, one of the first organisations to remove their grievance procedure and replace it with an issues resolution procedure. So some real kind of emphasis there on alternative systems for resolving conflict with some really big companies. But I guess the flagship organization and the one who's been one of the greatest advocates of this is Aviva, uh, the, the insurance company, who've been real um, leaders in the development of both flexible working practices, fairness at work, um, you know, Anthony Fitzpatrick um, could be the biggest fan, the, the head of employee relations at Aviva, but also took a brave step and a really powerful and positive step to introduce resolution across Aviva and replace their grievance procedure. And they hosted a, a video, uh, they hosted a video, they hosted a, a conference in October last year, which we have videoed and, and got online with case studies from various organisations. So how do we support our organisation, our customers? I'll just kind of, again, for those of you who don't know us, we help to design and embed resolution policies and frameworks and all the rest of it that goes with it. We help our, our clients to align their core values with their leadership behaviours and with their HR policies, that triangulation between those three critical factors. We help to set up in-house mediation schemes and provide mediation training and mediation services, of course. Also investigations, a really important part of our, of our, of our whole systems model, recognising not everything can be resolved through dialogue, although I'm a great uh, passionate advocate for, for resolving issues through dialogue, as you'll hear, but we recognise that actually a robust and fair investigation is also a critically important part of the overall spectrum of resolution remedies. We help companies to develop and embed fair and just cultures and, and run leadership and management training. We just uh, welcomed our head of programs, uh, Claire Gear on who I know is on this webinar today. Welcome Claire again to TCM who's, who's come and joined TCM to lead on some of the stuff around leadership. I published a book, uh, some of you may have seen the book already, Managing Conflict, it was actually published in 2017. But we've had some great reviews and some really positive feedback and Michael Gibbons, some of you may remember, was the person who reviewed the, um, dis the then dis um, statutory dispute resolution regulations. That was the point where there was no longer a statutory duty for you as an HR professional to have a discipline and grievance procedure in place. Just to state that again, there is no statutory, moral, legal or other duty for you to have a discipline or grievance procedure in place in your organisation. And Michael Gibbons was the, 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 the person who created the review that then led to the repeal of the statutory procedures. And we'll talk about the ACAS code, but just to get it out there at the very earliest stage, you can pretty much do 
whatever you want to do as a, as a company, as an HR professional, so long as you follow some minimum standards that are set out in the ACAS code, as you would expect through the process of natural justice. I'm going to talk about those, but people often say to me, we can't, we know we have to have a disciplinary procedure or a grievance procedure. There's a statutory duty to have one. And that's a myth, and I wanted to bust that myth right now at the very beginning of this. I'll model the TCM system. I'm not, I'm not going to go, I'll take about 45 minutes today going through this, but this is our whole systems a, a, a approach to bring the employee experience together with the customer experience. Um, what we help organisations do is to bring the values down off their lobby walls and make sense of them, to gather the evidence to drive the changes, to reframe the HR policy framework. You know, as, as I said to a colleague recently, I could write your employee handbook in three simple lines. Do no harm follow our values, stay within the law. And I've not just helped you to reduce the amount of paperwork that you have in your organisation, but I've also helped to save the proverbial rainforest. So we, we're about helping to simplify the policy framework, put people back in the HR policy framework. And of course, as I've mentioned already, a large part of our work therein uh, is about supporting leaders and managers to walk the talk, to deliver effective and engaging and, and high performing conversations to actually drive the results that you need as an organisation to be profitable, to be successful, to drive performance. I just want to say something again here at the very beginning. What's what we're talking about today is about bringing people together, human and humane relationships. This is not soft and fluffy stuff. This isn't about kind of creating a nice, let's have a great big hug and the world will be getting, getting on well or skipping through the meadow singing Kumbaya. These are powerful conversations which drive business success through an engaged, motivated workforce where our teams are united, working collaboratively to resolve shared problems in a compassionate and supportive way. And my hypothesis that I'm sharing with you today is that our traditional discipline and grievance procedures have, have, have a nail, a stake through the heart of our ability of our teams to function effectively. And actually, as a result of that, it becomes very, very difficult for us to drive that kind of high performance. And perhaps we can look to engage for success. We can think about the productivity gap. Yes, there are other factors that cause that. But I would argue today that this stuff that you can see on your screen, the behaviours that we see of conflict inhibits and challenges us and one of the things i know hr professionals they love they do love a bad behavior because bad behavior believe it or not actually helps us because if you behave badly um if you can't behave if you behave badly uh, as an employee we can investigate that bad behavior or a manager of course we can investigate that bad behavior and on the balance of probability 50 plus one percent 51 percent we can reach a determination as to whether or not that behavior fell within a threshold of of acceptability so in some respects in our organizations we love it when our people behave badly in fact the more badly you behave the happier we are because it's much easier for us to investigate and identify wrongdoing so we see all of these bad behaviours and we see the organisation, in essence, almost actively, and I'm a bit controversial here, I'm apology, well, I don't make apologies for it, we actively encourage those bad behaviours because the worse you behave, the easier it is for our policies and processes to actually work effectively and help and, 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 and secure a resolution. The resolution being about consistency, compliance and reasonable justice, reasonable uh, process. However, in my experience, the behaviours are just the tip of the iceberg. And if all we're concerned about when our people behave badly, whether it's through a conflict or through a disciplinary route, if all we do is focus on the behaviours and try and codify those behaviours as on the balance of probability the case did or didn't appear to, to happen, actually we miss so much on more information uh, and so much more narrative about helping the parties to find some form of a solution. So my starting point here is to recognise firstly is that conflicts, disputes, disagreements, disciplinary processes, we choose how to behave through those processes. And unfortunately, as you'll see, our brain tells us to behave badly, it tricks us into behaving badly because we perceive a threat. And our traditional systems and processes, which are quasi litigation inspired, they are reductive and actually they identify winners, losers, right or wrong because they can't function unless they do that. Our brain tricks us badly and the organisation's policies and procedures tell us to behave as badly as we can. But actually, and this is where it becomes very curious as a mediator and as a facilitator, we make choices about how we behave. We are adults. And I'm a big advocate and proponent of the development of adult to adult conversations in the workplace where people can make new choices based on insight, learning and understanding that comes through dialogue. 
But when I speak to people who've been dragged through a grievance procedure or hit over the head with a disciplinary policy and ask them, well, just tell me, share with me, if you will, some of the learning and the insight and the understanding that you gleaned from that process. They look at me as their eyes, as their eyes well up and they tell me about the sleepless nights and the horror that's been inflicted upon them because of the process. There's no learning. There's no insight. There's no growth. There's no opportunities for personal, professional development, productivity and increased engagement. It's miserable, it's sad, it's lonely, it's destructive, and it's dysfunctional. So as I said, it's not, so the policies and procedures are a script that drive bad behavior because without the bad behavior, the policy can't function. And there's a paradox for those of us in HR, for those of you in HR, is are you a custodian of a, of a process which scripts people to behave in badly and, 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 and scripts them to do the wrong thing, which I think many HR functions are, the custodians of disciplinary procedure or rather the custodians of an enabling supportive facilitative mentoring coaching mediation function that brings people together and there's a question there and maybe it's a question to take away after today so not only the policy framework and the system telling us to behave badly it's all going on up here as well so our brain the amygdala those of you who who may be familiar with the, with the chimp paradox and it's available on our, on our website we have a, a really um great library of texts and books on our, on our website the tcngroup.com and you can buy these books on on there and sit down and read but i would highly recommend the chimp paradox if you've not read it so the chimp is another name for the amygdala this sort of almond shark shaped part of our brain which senses danger and without getting too deep into the neuroscience and psychology of conflict in essence we see the threat that amygdala fires off um uh, uh responses that drives the release of cortisol and adrenaline the, the stressor hormones and it's those very same stressor hormones that drive the fight flight freeze or fall response so if we know that the policy framework is stressful we know people are going to behave badly within it so not only is the policy framework driving the wrong behavior it's actually creating stress which then drives the negative behaviors which come out as confrontation clashes and the negativity the belligerence and the polarization that often we see and it's an interesting, um, those of you from, from the NHS may know Chris Turner from, a, from an organisation called Civility Saves Lives. But within the NHS, they're very concerned about this stuff. Because if I shout at a junior doctor in theatre when they are doing an operation on a patient, and actually they have that um, amygdala response and the drive of cortisol, actually the evidence suggests from uh, uh, Civility Saves Lives that my cognitive ability is reduced by up to 50% for three minutes. And what that means in a theatre, in, in, in an NHS organisation, we could actually uh, do, do harm to someone. But actually, if you widen that out and look at your organisation policy framework, the question I'd ask for, for yourselves in HR is if your policy framework invokes a stressor response which drives, a, which drives cortisol, we are directly contributing to a lack of cognitive ability of our people because we are creating stress. Conversely, by creating an environment where people can talk and listen and engage with each other, actually we remove the cortisol and the, the adrenaline and we start to replace it with those positive hormones. And we start to get people thinking and having a more open mind, a high growth mindset, listening to each other. And I'll talk a little bit more about the, the, the role of dopamine, endorphins, oxytocin and so on and so forth. But when you go back to your grievance and disciplinary procedure, maybe take a green pen and mark with a green pen all of the parts of the policy which would, would encourage a positive mindset response and all of the parts of the policy which promote a cortisol response and watch how much red ink you have on your policy framework. No wonder people behave badly. We're telling them to do it. In fact, we're not telling them, we're instructing them to behave as badly as we can. So I'll go into the policy framework and the resolution, what, what alternatives are, but these, this, it's damaging and divisive. And if you don't believe me, go and ask someone who's at home now watching Homes Under the Hammer because they can't sit in the same room as their manager. Go and ask them right now, what's going on for you? They'll tell us this. The challenge oftentimes is we don't listen to them. So our policy framework is like doing GBH on our staff, grievance, bullying and harassment, GBH. It's all, it has the same effect. You know, I deal with people who are victims of antisocial behaviour and crime. They tell me they can't sleep. They tell me it's affecting relationships at home. It's affecting relationships at work. They can't concentrate. I speak to people going through GBH or discipline, disciplinary procedures. It's exactly the same. And what are we doing to our people? Why are we doing this? There's no statutory, moral, ethical reason to have these policies in place. 
yet when we do it, it shows up on our engagement scores, on our absence scores, on our well-being scores. I do deep dives into complex organizations and I ask these questions and there's a direct correlation between how we treat people at times of uncertainty, stress, be grievance, complaint, conflict, and their levels of engagement and their well-being and their absence levels. So yeah, when I go to HR professionals and business leaders and I say, do you, do you believe me? They say, yes, the evidence is absolutely clear, David. We believe you. I say, well, look, where's your conflict resolution strategy? And I've seen better strategies for ordering paper clips in organizations than I have for handling this stuff in the workplace, for handling conflict. Something which has such a damaging impact, as we'll see, actually is not treated as a strategic priority. It's as damaging as smoking to the human body. And these are just some of the costs, time and money, legal costs, reputation, well-being, absence, attrition, engagement and productivity. And I'm sure on your people plan, if we get your people plan out right now, at least two or maybe three of those will be key strands or pillars within your people plan and your people strategy. So not only um, are we starting to see a shift in mindset and culture, but actually the use of resolution is delivering against the people priorities within your organisation. And this is where I think it becomes very powerful. Because resolution now is becoming a strategic driver of an improved workplace. But of course, as we know from the CIPD, it needs to be evidence based. And less than, less, <laughs> what do you say? Less than 10% of cases that go through GBH policies result in any form of sanction against the, wrong, the alleged wrongdoer. And again, if you don't believe me, just go and do a random sample of some of your grievance and bullying and harassment cases. And if you're getting into double figures, you're doing well. More often than not, it's into single figures. So you go through all of this misery and horror and sadness and upset. And just to be told at the end, well, you know, on the balance of probability, we weren't able to reach determination due to a lack of available evidence. Of course, what they're hearing is you're a liar. You're lying. You didn't, you didn't come to us telling the truth. And that's where, of course, a good employee, if they were, hadn't lost motivation already, they're now onto LinkedIn. They're now looking for alternative employment, taking all of your training, all of your knowledge, all of your IP and taking that and going somewhere else. Just because we failed to sit down and do the one thing which resolution suggests is giving them a jolly good listening to. And that's what flow is. This is positive psychology. It's, you know, we'll talk about fight, flight, freeze, or fall. You might remember the earlier slide, those, those F responses driven by the amygdala and the release of adrenaline and cortisol. And flow draws directly from positive psychology, the work of Martin Seligman and others, about trying to create flow happiness and that we strive towards being happy as human beings and strive towards a state of flow. And we've all experienced this. But I think we can extend flow out to be an organisational factor, flow of ideas, of dialogue, of compassion, of empathy, of mutual recognition, of understanding, of insight. And actually, when we start to introduce flow and positive psychology into our HR policies and procedures, we see those taking a very different form. Especially where those policies and procedures aren't just about driving flow for the individual, but they're aligning to the corporate values. They're no longer about risk aversion, they're about relationship building and relationship management. Okay, well that's my that's my hypothesis. Um, if you wanted to hear it, I suppose you are here because you did. I'm very happy to answer questions. Jamie, you've asked me a question about encouraging people to uh, take part in mediation who are resistant. I'm going to come to that. Um, in a moment, Gemma, because I've got some really good ideas I'm going to share with you um, to help get a co secure commitment to mediation, because I'm up to 1,564 reasons why the two parties should never get in a room with each other. And Gemma, do you want to know how many reasons I've heard that are actually good? Precisely zero. And I don't mean to be disparaging of the individual's anxiety and fear and their perceptions that they have. But it's always perception based, Gemma. And the fear of dialogue is based on the perceptions we formed at a point where we're under stress and therefore we're not able to think straight. So those perceptions need to be challenged, both systemically, structurally, and also through our policy frameworks. And actually, when we challenge them and the parties get in a room with each other, Gemma, what they say is that it's amazing. It's amazing. What they say to me is this David, why didn't we do this? two weeks ago, two months ago, two years ago, 20 years, years ago, fill in, fill, in the, fill in the blank. And the other thing I think is really powerful is this wasn't as bad as I was expecting it to be. No, it wasn't because you listen to each other and there's nothing more powerful, there's nothing more effective than listening empathetically, reflectively, with respect, with compassion. And of course we can offer facilitators, but you know something, Gemma, the best conversations don't have a facilitator there. 
and this might sound a little bit, you know, going to that soft and fluffy stage of the process, a cake and a, and a cup of tea. Now, I haven't got shares in Costa, by the way, or Nero, or any of the other coffee shops, but take your conflict out and have a conversation with each other. We don't need mediators. We've just become fearful. We've relied on emails and all this stuff to resolve our problems and formality and lawyers and no, no, no. A cup of coffee. Let's do it the old way. Maybe the old ways are the best, certainly when it comes to resolving conflict. So this is about shifting from the red to the green. The, the language is shifting. The mindset is shifting. The policy framework is shifting. Um, I've got a couple of comments going through about the PDF link on how a resolution unit can reduce stress is broken. So thank you for everyone who's flagging that. So I will resend out. So I've noted everyone, thank you. I will resend the link out about the role of the resolution unit. I'm going to say a little bit about that now, Claire, um, for, who's just flagged this with me. So I will um, mention it now and I will also resend the link out. So thanks very much for flagging the broken link. So the resolution, let's get into what this looks like. So the resolution policy, I've just revised the resolution policy. So this was launched in 2014. I did a second iteration of it in around 2018. And the latest iteration was finished and shared with a customer last week. And the new resolution policy is an extraordinarily well-structured system, which brings together disciplinary and grievance processes together under a single overarching policy. I'm going to share with you now the overarching themes and principles of the resolution policy and describe to you how it works. So it's a new approach for dealing with this. So we need a new approach. The old systems are broken, tired. You know, I could use lots of negative words and I'm not going to do that. You know, I'll let you form your own view, but I've, I don't have a good experience of them. But I'll let you form your own view. It starts with, so it starts with dialogue, actually, as you'll see from the uh, flowchart. But actually, rather than submitting a grievance or engaging in a disciplinary process, the individual concern raises a request for resolution. And the request for resolution is written using positive psychology and appreciative inquiry, asks what does a fair outcome look like? What are you willing to contribute to secure the fair, fair outcome? What are you willing to do to get that? What do you, impact is this having? What impact is it having on the other person? And what action are you willing to take to help get to that formal route? To, the, to get to that successful route. It's aligned to the value. So rather than the policy framework starting, well, the ACAS code says X, well, no one cares what the ACAS code says. That's immediately putting us on a defensive risk averse position. Actually, scrap that, of course we care what the ACAS code says. That should be at the end, not the beginning. What we should start with is our core values, our respect, excellence, compassion, integrity. What that means is when we fall out, we will fall out. When we fall out, we solve issues according. We use our values as the blueprint. We bring together key stakeholders. When we work with organizations, we run focus groups. We, run, we do deep listening. We listen to people. We go and talk to people who've been through this. And then we bring them together to share their ideas. And actually, one of the things that surprised me when we get them talking is what, who'd have thought conflict could be such fun? And really, how could conflict bring people together in such an exciting way? This stuff's been like walking through treacle for too long. Let's change the, the vernacular. It's about the HR and ER function triaging cases. I'll talk more about the triage. And it underpins the development of that fair and just culture. It's fully compliant with the ACAS code. And someone asked me recently, you know, has it been tested? Well, it has by the Imperial Hotels in London. And there's a case study on our website where the Employment Tribunal offered glowing feedback in relation to the work that Gemma Todd and her team in the HR department at Imperial Hotels had done to drive a culture of constructive resolution. And Gemma spoke very passionately at a webinar that we ran previously. It also includes toolkits as a framework. I often think of this as a framework than a, more than a policy. So it includes checklists, video content, materials, support for people to go out and have those conversations. And it demystifies it rather than that, this horrible process that sits in the employee handbook that no one really wants to read unless there's a problem. Now it's a framework which enables and supports conversations to happen across the organization. It has a process map, a, a framework. Um, and uh, Joanna, just to alert you, I'm going to come to you after this um, this process map just to get some hints and tips for you, just to put you on alert. Also a chance for me to catch my breath, Joanna. Um, but I'll just go through this flow chart very quickly uh, with you. So on the orange side, on the left hand side, yeah, it's about encouraging attempts at a local level to resolve issues. 
But those attempts are not just happened as a discretionary activity um, on an ad hoc basis. They're designed into the resolution policy. When we work with organisations to develop case management systems, actually the case management system is extended to support those. So where people access materials or videos or other content, that is logged. So we're seeing how much activity is happening in the line. We're also introducing line management competencies and line management training to encourage that that orange bar to be a bigger part of the whole. Of course, they, we can't always resolve issues through the orange bar and through the dialogue, so we then need to go into the formal route. And as I said earlier, the formal route begins with a request for resolution rather than the grievance uh, form. And that is then submitted to a resolution unit, resolution at mycompany.com. And that resolution unit will tr assess the case and triage it against a set of objective criteria called the resolution index. So it scores uh, and uh, the, 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 the situation against the number of scoring criteria, one to five, and those criteria are complexity, frequency, the needs of the parties, the impact of the case, the uh, risk to the individual and the risk to the, to the employer. So it's using objective criteria. So anyone who's concerned about resolution being um, impacted on, on consistency and compliance, it's the most consistent and objective and fair way to measure the most appropriate route to resolution. We then look at which bucket to put the case in. Is it going to an early resolution bucket or a formal resolution bucket? Well, it's biased towards early resolution because early resolution dialogue is the best way to resolve issues. That might be, let's go back to the manager and have that conversation. Or would it help to have a coach or a mentor to support you? Maybe it would be beneficial to have someone there as a facilitator. And that might be an HR rep, a union or a manager who would act as a facilitator in a facilitated conversation. Or it's a more serious case and it scores more highly on the resolution index. It would benefit from having a, um, a, uh, a support of a mediator. OK, so I've just seen another question. I just got distracted by another question that was coming through there from someone who shares my surname. So, Joanna, hi there. So uh, how are you? So, um, yeah, I'll come to your question in a moment, if I may. So um, and also, so I've mentioned the mediation. It may be in some cases it score more, scores more highly through the triage process. And in that case, you'll move to a formal resolution process. So, again, some people are concerned. Is this just about trying to resolve everything through dialogue? Well, yes, it is. But there are some cases that can't be. So you reserve the right to investigate or suspend and investigate in order to be able to get to the facts of a particular case. And that fact finding exercise may then result in a formal resolution meeting, which is the old name for a hearing. Hearing being mommy and daddy are very cross with you, naughty child. And that parent child relationship, which we know comes up through hearings and everyone's defensive. And we know the best form of defense is attack. So it, it diminishes that parent child attack and defend modality to something a little bit more aligned to an adult to adult conversation. So I'm inspired by family group conferencing and restorative conferencing as part of that process. That might result in, in an outcome. Of course, the individual has the right to be accompanied to that process. If you if you if if you might be you need to go into another process. So if you don't use this for disciplinary, you might need to go into a disciplinary route if it's more senior, serious, or a performance or a capability or an absence route. So, of course, this is just about handling in the first stage those grievance uh, cases. But as, as I've said, this is extended now to incorporate disciplinary processes as well. I'll talk more about that. Of course, the individual also has the right to appeal. So we're now com fully compliant with the ACAS code. The individuals have the right to meet. They've had the right to be accompanied and they've had the right to appeal. Those are your three basic principles that you must have within your policy framework in order to be able to deliver a fair and just outcome. Without those three, you'll leave the tribunal and it will be unfair and it should be unfair you know those are three principles of natural justice that are embedded in the ACAS code that I completely concur with. So that's the process map and when we work with organisations we shape it and develop it and move it around but as I said it's becoming expansive and more and more of our organisations are expressing a desire to extend this into other areas. So discipline, performance, capability, absence. In fact, some organizations, it would appear to me, are shifting their entire policy framework relating to relationships and behaviors under a res resolution umbrella. Whew, it's exciting stuff. Okay, it's also time for me to take a break. So let me find Joanna on our list of um, uh, people who are dialed in here. So Joanna Wheelahan is one of our, well, not one of our, <laughs> you're not one of our head of resolution services, Joanna. You are the head and resolution services and I don't know Joanna if you can hear me and whether you're you're able to introduce yourself. 
Yes, I'm testing. Am I audible? Got you. Got you. Fantastic. So, Jaila, you know, you, you, you know this stuff. You're working with customers on the front line. Like, you, like I said, you've just come back from a, a customer meeting this morning to, to a, a large ambulance trust who are embedding this within that organisation. What, what are your kind of would well, like to introduce yourself, I suppose, Jaila, and then could you share with those on those folk on today's webinar? Yeah, you know, what are your practical tools and tips and, 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 and recommendations to help to embed a culture of resolution? within their organisations. Thanks, David. Um, yes, I'm Joanna Whelan. I head up the Resolution Services Department here at TCM, and that means um, overseeing our mediations, um, external, um, any training that happens in that space, and more increasingly, helping organisations to embrace and kind of roll out this resolution index including mediation services within the organization. So it's become, it's keeping us very, very busy. Um, and that's fantastic news and that the message is out there. So David, I think you wrote the first policy in 2004. And uh, finally, people are really, they're dialing into the benefits that, that a resolution policy can offer an organization. So when I was thinking today about the webinar and all the good stuff that you've been telling uh, telling the, the audience um, up to now, David, I was thinking, okay, these are all the steps that people should be taking. Definitely get in touch with us we'd love to talk to you but ultimately how do you start or, or what are the kind of the key messages i would say um more what i've learned over the last while as we rolled them out with, with organizations small and big and everything in between um i think what i'd first say is be true to your organizational values and david earlier mentioned taking those values off the, the lobby wall you know off the coffee cups and off your email signatures they're there for a reason People have probably spent a lot of money and a lot of time developing those organizational values. And the resolution policy will, I would almost bet in my house on the fact that the, the resolution policy supports those values and aligns to those values. So anytime there is a pushback or resilience, you can rely on those to kind of to, to promote the resolution uh, way forward. Yeah, so they will there will be um, an alignment for, between your your organizational values and the resolution policy, the resolution index. Number two of my kind of takeaways is begin with the end in mind. Now, I'm obviously stealing that from Stephen Covey, but it's a fantastic lesson because at the beginning of something like this, maybe some people are dialing onto this and hearing this message for the first time, and it sounds absolutely outrageous to get rid of, you know, a grievance policy, a disciplinary policy. How would we function? Imagine, or try and imagine, um, a beautiful future where people are just having such great conversations that you hardly need uh, a grievance policy, a disciplinary policy. You know, this is the this is the future that we want to imagine. And then set up those steps, because maybe we don't see that in our lifetime, yes? Maybe we, we'll always have dysfunctional conflict. How can you get there? So what are the steps? And that's what Dave and I would love to you know, help you talk about. What needs to happen first? What are the conversations? Who needs to be trained? Do we need to review our policy right now, or can we wait? Um, and I think my last, uh, my last takeaway, or my last um, lesson will be think big and small. Um, for my last lesson, you know, start with the end in mind, but also look at what you can get done tomorrow or today. Can you get, a, you know, folks together, various networks across the organization to fact find, to do a little bit of training, do a little bit of coaching? Because if you know where you want to get to, there's a lot of things you can do um, on the way there. Training and empathy, training and emotional intelligence for your, for your managers. And it can even just be a quick chat with one manager. All of these steps are helping you to get to that fair and just culture that we want in our organizations. So I think those three steps would be my kind of holistic takeaways um, from what, we, what we've been learning from organizations over the last couple of years introducing this policy. Fantastic, Joanna. Thank you so much. That's about aligning to our core values. Know what the end point looks like, even though it might be not absolutely clear, it's about that fair and just culture, that kind of positive kind of culture that you're describing is in small steps forward it's an iterative process you know we love that agile thinking that kind of that that, that moving towards something it's never going to be perfect but what is going to be perfect is the sound of the shredding machine shredding your grievance and disciplinary procedures that is perfect you will never hear a better sound beside of christmas and the sound of bells ringing that is perfect sound but then what we do is we start to put something in place and it's a steady and stage process so thank you john it's, it's thrown up some great questions as well we've got a couple of questions to claire and rachel and others these questions relate to um to, to leadership and, and management and i think john you, you were saying this and I, again before you do 
jump off maybe join any thoughts on this because you, you touched on the role of managers and I think mm. managers you know it's important to have in, built into their competency frameworks the stuff you were mm. describing emotional intelligence but really if you can very quickly answer Claire's and questions question Claire's and Rachel's questions Joanna which is about how do we bring leaders and managers in and how do we give them the skills they need to do the stuff that they're required to do in the line to resolve these issues have you got the miracle answer in 10 seconds <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm <laughs> tends, no. We're all disappointed. Um, <laughs> it's great that those questions are being asked because, um, you know, we do get to blame our managers, not in a um, blaming yeah. way, but they don't oftentimes have the skills or competencies or the confidence to start these conversations. So yeah. rather than, you know, boss bashing because they've been promoted because they're technically excellent, maybe they don't have the skills, you know, to, to, to manage the hopes and dreams of 27 staff or 500 staff, yeah. um, but we can upskill them in very small chunks as well. We can literally say, you know, how's your active listening? How is your empathy? Um, and, and they would be ready to, you know, to have one you know, conversation if they're not thinking that way. So small steps, but you definitely have a focus on training them and making sure that they feel competent to to have those conversations. Joanna, amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel, Claire. I hope that's giving you a suicide. I think one thing I would say is I've never seen a grievance form or a bullying allegation which said this, Dear HR and CEO and Boris Johnson and everyone else who, who wants to receive my email, my manager listens to me too much and tries to put themselves in my shoes a little bit too frequently. I've never read it. I've never heard of a situation where managers have been too empathetic and too driven to engage in dialogue. And that's my experience is what parties want. And it goes back to a question that was raised earlier by Joanna, Joanna Little. It's a great name though, Giles. Thank you. So another Johanna um, who asked in relation to, is this all a bit too, not, I'm going to paraphrase you here, Johanna. You asked, is it a bit too soft and fluffy? But you said, is, are the parties feeling they're giving something up to engage in a consensual process? Absolutely not. What the, part, what the question we often fail to ask when we're in a grievance or disciplinary route is what is it that you need as an outcome? What does a fair outcome look like? What do you want is the wrong question. Is it... No, it's a wrong question. I can't put it another way. What do you want drives polarity, belligerence, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a, I want them dismissed. I want them hung, drawn, and quartered. And actually, what the parties might appear from what I want and the stated response to a want question is for some sort of combative process. When we dig a layer deeper, Joanna, what they tell us they need, and this is really important, what they need is to be heard, for the behaviour to stop to be able to explain the impact on the other person, to listen to what the other person has to say, because they know they're not a bad person. They're just behaving in a particular way and it's just needing to be addressed. And actually, when we focus on this being a needs based system of resolution, actually, it takes us much closer to what our people say is important to them. So parties are not looking. They don't want they don't want the confrontation. They want the resolution. And this is what we, you know, we have certain expectations through this process of what people will do and employees and their representatives, you know, they're required to raise issues. You can't just sit on a case, wait for six months and then expect the HR to get their magic wand out and resolve everything. But it's not that, that does, for those of you in HR who are doing case management, you'll know that doesn't work. You know, it makes it much harder to get issues out into the open earlier. Expect to engage in dialogue. If you've chosen to work with our company and our values are clearly stated and our values run through our company like Blackpool runs through a rock in the way that Joanna was describing, you're not going to see dialogue as something that happens to them over there, but not for me because my case is too serious. It's part, I'm part of the fabric. I'm part of the culture. So engage in issues. Expect there to be a dialogue offered and, and you know, rec recognise that you have the opportunity to go to a formal route, but it's not the only route to resolution. For HR, it's about resourcing this, providing that triage function. You know, we're seeing more and more HR functions rebranding themselves to people and culture functions. And for those of you who are thinking about doing that within your HR team, you're going to get a double thumbs up from me because it's the best thing we can do. Putting our people at the centre of our organisations and HR is the enabler. Not They don't own, they're not the they're not the culture, but they're an enabler of the culture. And this stuff we're talking about is substantive cultural change leading to a fair and just learning, uh, pro productive culture within our organizations. And for managers and leaders, uh, you know, expect to be managing people. You know, you can't opt out of this stuff. People are people and your job as a manager 
is to, to to manage them but i've run workshops and conferences and i've you know, from 1980 not 1980s 1990s and people said to me yes but david our, our managers are recruited because of their technical skills not their people skills fast forward to 2020 people are still saying this to me so we need to develop those empathy and emotional intelligence and relationship intelligence and those listening, as Joanna was talking about, into our role descriptions and the role profiles that we then recruit and hire and develop our managers against. If our managers don't have it written in, this is you know one of the weaknesses for me of the uh, Ulrich model of HR, if it's not written in and designed, it's chaos. And then we expect our managers to deal with this difficult stuff without any training or support or with it being written in. No wonder they push back. And as Joanna said, you know, a British, one of our British hobbies, now that Brexit's getting out of the way, is bas we can go back to a bit of boss bashing. We love a bit of, bit of boss bashing in this country. Bosses are the problem. They are. But they're also the solution. And we can't beat up on them because they've often not been given the skills they need. And Joanna, I think, articulated that. So we help organisations to introduce a new vernacular. It's all about resolution. And again, I'm happy to talk about this offline. And it's not just me saying this. The HR profession map is clearly stating that this stuff is important for, for you, for, for us, for, for the organization as a whole. It's all part of trying to create a culture of resolution for the organization. And it's about being principles led, values based, outcomes oriented, and helping to resolve issues in a make more constructive, a more effective and a more compassionate way. So the stuff we're talking about today is directly aligned to the HR profession map. And I would certainly recommend very strongly the recent uh, CIPD report on managing conflict, which makes for a very valuable and a very insightful read. I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to move forward at pace now as we come to an end, but I will be staying online to answer any further questions that any of you have for me, uh, or I guess, Joanna, if you can stay online as well, about any aspect of resolution. But wow, look at this stuff. Who wouldn't want to be in an app? But what I would say is don't, let's not try and do everything, and it does do all of this, but align, as I said at the start of the presentation, align resolution to your people plan. So if you're concerned about driving up engagement, if you're concerned about workforce planning, if you're concerned about litigation and legal fees, then align what you're doing to your core strategic priorities, whatever they might be, because that then gets you into the board to be able to present and get ownership. Use an evidence base. This, this, a, a large uh, UK bank have just done this, and I was in, uh, I was with Claire. I think it was on her second or third day, and they were presenting the statistics and empirical data that they'd gathered. And in that organization, and I won't go into a lot of detail because uh, I think they're, they're on the call, but in that organization, the savings just on the headline savings of introducing resolution were looking to be somewhere in the, uh, the immediately of a million pounds per annum. And this was, came through from the from the calculator that they've done. So they, I mean, they were just absolutely blown away by the figure. So this is a figure. And if you're interested, please do let me know. I'll send this through to you as an Excel spreadsheet rather than a PowerPoint slide. And there's loads of case studies on our website and videos. There's the video from the um, uh, the conference at Aviv, which I mentioned, we had Cap Gemini talking, the Greater London Authority. We had um, various organisations. The UK Civil Service, we, we, we're the provider of the mediation support to the UK Civil Service, and we're just about to publish a case study of that work. But this work, published by ACAS, which gives it a high level of independence by two fantastic academics, Richard Saundry and Paul Latrey. Uh, this is a piece of work that, that myself and my team did in Northumbria Healthcare NHS Trust, is to yet the most forensic analysis of the integration of, of resolution methodologies into organisation. And just as a little bit of a snapshot, this organisation was one of the worst performing trusts in the UK in terms of bullying and harassment and staff survey. I think last year they were number two and they, they switched between one and two in terms of the best organisations in the NHS in terms of how they tackle bullying and harassment. I won't, I won't say this was the only factor, but it was a significant factor in helping that organisation to make the shift. So that's the, that's the webinar kind of come, come to an end. What I'd like to do is just run a little bit of a poll it's just a bit of fun. I don't think you'd call this scientific at all. But would you, uh, are you ready, based on what you've heard today and what you know already, are you ready to join the resolution revolution? So you're going to see on your uh, screens at the moment, you can simply press yes, no, unsure, obviously, if you're unsure. But it's just to get a feel based on what you've heard. Would you be willing to give it a bit of a go, to make a difference, to join the resolution revolution? Okay, so we've got... I should be able to see how many people have. Yes, 70. Gosh, we've got a good a good turnout for today's um, for today's poll. 
So I'm going to close the poll in five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so I'm going to close the poll now. So out of all of the attendees, I think we had 78% of you um, have voted. I'm going to close that now and it should display the outcomes of the poll. Can you see it? Ah, there we go. Wow, Woo, that's amazing. 82% of people are willing to give this a go. Well, if you're willing to give it a go and if you're interested, you know, we are here to support you and our support can be behind the scenes, front of house, whatever you need, training managers. I've got the, the, the latest version of the resolution policy. I'm not going to be giving it out free. As you can imagine, there's a lot of work gone into it. But if you would like to have a conversation with me and to meet with me and to get, a, to get the latest version of the resolution policy, and so there's a lot of work gone into it, I am happy to share it free of charge on the basis that we sit down and meet and talk through it. And as long as you buy me the coffee or, <laughs> or we have a coffee where you're at, I'm very happy to share that with you. 15% of you are unsure. So for those of you who are unsure, uh, again, really happy to have a further conversation with you and answer questions. I'll stay online now. And, and only 3% of people were not persuaded today. And that's fair enough. I'd be really curious to know as well from those of you who were not, um, who were not persuaded what it would take to help you to make the shift forward. So I'll enjoy the webinar today. This isn't for now, but please, you know, as, as you're sort of wrapping up from today, please think a little bit about what you'll take away from today's webinar to help you create a culture of resolution in your own workplaces. And this is just my, my final thoughts. It's, we can't just bolt another initiative on. We've, we've had enough of initiatives in our organization. This just requires a more sophisticated response. So think about this as a systemic issue and apply systems thinking in how we tackle this stuff and as i said earlier some very simple stuff around values culture hr processes and management and leadership behaviors it doesn't have to be complicated but we start to see patterns and draw out themes that help us to identify how to resolve these issues be innovative be creative there's never been a better time we desperately need a better time you know i haven't mentioned the word brexit well i did not mention brexit in passing but we need to be good at driving performance and engaged workforce and we can't do that with with this stuff going on so it's 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 i'd say this is a, in a, a critical yeah, you know, ensure your values are, are, are enshrined in your policies and procedures. You can, I say, you can maybe your employee handbook is going to be more than three lines, but do no harm. Follow your values. Stay within the law. It's not complicated. Bring the modern triumvirate, HR management unions together, resolving problems. Pluralism, I'm a massive fan of. Support managers and leaders. Many of you have sort of touched on that in the questions that you've asked over the course of the webinar today. Uh, and finally, join the resolution revolution, as indeed 82% of you look like you're about to go and embark on just that, which I can't say uh, good luck enough. So I'm really excited and enthusiastic for you. You'll, you'll, you'll honestly, you'll love it. It's the best thing you could do. Um, it, it's just, it's amazing. Anyway, I'll stop there. That's me. I'm on LinkedIn and uh, a bit on Twitter. I know Erica, you're on here from our, our, our PR um, and communications consultant. I must I must do more Twitter. I know Erica, but LinkedIn is my sort of preferred uh, system of choice. So if you do want to connect with me or have a conversation with me, please do find me on LinkedIn. But for now, I'm going to say thank you so much for uh, joining the webinar. Um, thank you for the really lovely positive feedback that's already starting to come through. It sounds like it's kind of caught, caught capture the nerve, but. Uh, Caught, caught a nerve or caught a moment. Um, but I'm going to 